the last day of the SUNY Online Summit and to uh, uh, the workshop that we have planned for you today with uh, Patrice Prusco and Whitney Kilgore. I'm, I'm not gonna read their bios. You can see their bios on our website and I'm gonna let them really introduce themselves. But I just wanted to say, um, you know, a very give Whitney and Patrice a warm welcome. Um, Patrice is actually one of our own. She started out, at least when I met her at Empire State College uh, and then moved on to Cornell and um, and is now at Harvard and has been um, a longtime friend and colleague uh, and I'm just so excited to have to have you back to your home um, at, here in SUNY uh, which you will always have um, and to Whitney um, you know I the first time I met Whitney I was at some random conference in somewhere USA and um, and I can't remember if she tweeted it or I did but some it was, one of us tweeted uh is anyone here and want to have dinner and and so one or the other of us said yes and we went out to dinner that's how i met whitney through through twitter at some random conference so i and and she is a kindred spirit like sister from another mother totally because yeah. Um, as an instructional designer, um, we just have had many parallel experiences um, with Patrice too. I mean, you know, we're, we're all kindred spirits here, I think. So a very well, a warm welcome to you both. And thank you for doing this for us. Uh, very, very um, happy to have you here and to share you and your work, especially in this moment in time um, with our community of online practitioners. I think this is such an amazing way to end the summit, to start to end the summit. It. Um, so thanks very much for you being here for your work and for this session. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. We are really, really excited to be asked to share with the group. Um, so fond of, of you and the entire SUNY online team. Um, so it does feel like being invited to talk to friends and colleagues, and that's very exciting to me. Um, I think we'll start with just brief introductions. Patrice, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, so as Alex, uh, as Alexandra said, um, I started at SUNY Empire State College and was at SUNY for many years. And thank you. I do still feel very much like a part of the family. So it is, it is really great to be back. Currently, I'm the Associate Director of Learning Design at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And like many people here, I imagine, um, we've spent the last almost year um, supporting faculty and pivoting to a fully online program and um, have been experiencing a lot of compassion fatigue. And so I'm just really grateful to um, share the space with all of you and um, hear your stories. Thanks, Patrice. And I'm Whitney Kilgore, as Alex mentioned, kindred spirit instructional designer. Um, I got my start in K-12 and grew up in the instructional technology space into higher education almost 20 years ago. Um, and have been building online programs, teaching faculty how to use technology in classroom settings, hybrid blended online learning, um, and have found my niche outside of institutions of higher education because I felt like I could be more of a change agent and help faculty really embrace the affordances of the technologies in order to really advance pedagogically. And this last year, even, even outside the fence, right? Because I work for, uh, for iDesign supporting over 65 institutions and their faculty in this transformation. Um, for some, it's, uh, it is very much emergency remote teaching and we've had to come up with different support models for that within our own organization. So the stretch exercises have been quite um, expansive, um, but we've actually been able to come up with service offerings to help reduce some of the burden on the teams inside organizations of higher education so that those individuals, those instructional design teams could take time off over the holidays. They actually could take the full two weeks off and redirect to someone else. So um, this, this, the reason we're here today, when I when I first jumped on the call, I was listening to some of the words Alex and Aaron were saying, and it was dedicated passionate, thoughtful ambassadors, change agents, all of you care so deeply about the work that you do. So that's really the reason I think we're having this conversation about burnout and compassion fatigue. But before we get too deep into that, which I'll have Patrice tell you a little bit more about the article and what we're gonna do today, I wanted to set the stage for 
oh, wait, can I do this with a fake background? Um, <laughs> Um, we're going to use a tool from the toolbox called Liberating Structures. Many of you may be familiar with Liberating Structures, but if you're not, I wanted to be sure to share one of my favorite books. When I stumbled on this, and I think it was printed in like 2013, but when I stumbled on this back in 2015, 2016 timeframe, I thought to myself, I go to conferences all the time. I feel like a lot of sessions are very replication of lecture. There's got to be a better way. This book it's um, transformational ideas on how you can actually get people active and engaged in conversations and prototype. And so I would encourage you all. There's a great website that goes along with it, but the book is better than the website, just so you know. Um, but I would encourage you all to take a look at it. Today, we'll use the uh, Mad T <laughs> format, which is one of the liberating structures for the, the process that we're going to work through with you today. And so that's a little background of what we'll do and, and how we'll do it. But Tr Patrice, do you want to jump into the article and kind of orient everybody to compassion fatigue? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll just add that um, Whitney got me hooked on liberating structures. She introduced me to it um, and I've been using it as well. And I think somebody can throw the, the link to the book in the chat in a minute. Um, so as Whitney mentioned uh, in, um, December of 2020, we wrote an article called Burned Out Stories of Compassion Fatigue, and there's a link to the article in the Google Doc that we'll be working in. Um, so about a year-ish before that, I had written an article for Ed Surge on burnout in the learning design profession, um, just thinking about how uh, not only how overworked learning designers were, but that we were feeling somewhat like a Swiss army knife, right? We're just constantly being asked to be experts in everything and take on everything. And I didn't realize at the time that one of the things that we were taking on was the uh, compassion fatigue and the feelings of our students and our faculty and other people. And as we got into spring and a few months into COVID and everybody was feeling really burned out, and I was listening to stories of other people, I was hearing that from my colleagues, how, you know, how not only how deeply they cared, which we all do, but that, you know, when they were working with faculty, like everyone was experiencing such trauma. And we were taking on that trauma of the faculty that we were working with, of the students, you know, who we wanted to, you know, have the, the best possible experience for every single student. We're taking it on for our team members, for our families at home. And so I did a little bit of research and came up with this idea of compassion fatigue. And um, as you might imagine, I, Whitney and I started talking about this in maybe like May. Um, and it took us until December to really gather, do the interviews and gather all the information because we were just all under such pressure at the time. And I think, you know, now is actually, um, I'm finding a very timely to revisit this concept with everyone. Uh, I'm not sure at your university, but I know like at our university, um, we, we did a lot of student surveys and, you know, moving from fall semester to spring, we're looking at a lot of those student stories. And as we all know, when we get you know, feedback from our students and evaluations, even if there's one piece of feedback that is not good and you know, 99 other pieces are great. It's that one piece that sticks with us. And so I found that this is actually an additional thing that people are taking on now um, is, you know, the hearing, as we're hearing the student experiences and what's, and what's happening. And so as Whitney mentioned, we're going to be using the Liberating Structures format. And we've created a Google Doc with um, questions that are actually the same questions we used to interview people for the article. And what we would like to do is allow everyone a few minutes to um, have quiet time to read through these questions and share a story, an experience. Um, and some of the things that I want to note is when, when you write in this document, the document is anonymous, but it's also a public, it, it, it's a publicly facing document. So I'd just like you to keep that in mind. And with that, um, after we've um, spent some time in the in the document writing, we'll come together to share. And so we'd just like to remind everyone about confidentiality. Um, take lessons that you learned, but leave the details. 
um, assume, assume best intent when people are, are sharing, listen to understand and respond with compassion. And with that, um, is, we'll add the link to the chat if it hasn't been added already. And what we would like to do is give you about 20 minutes to have some quiet time to reflect and write in this document. And then what we'll do is look through for some themes that are emerging, and then we'll come back together to, to talk. And we think it's important to wrap up with some positive steps, you know, you know, things that you can do when you leave this session to really feel like you're making a difference. So Patrice, I did share the link to the document that looks like we okay. have about 33 people in it already and climbing. Great. We should be in good shape. Um, on one thing I'll just add, we did um, try and put in a few bullets to get you started. So just pick a bullet and start writing. Does anyone have any questions?
And just like that, 90 some individuals were able to sit with their thoughts and share very candidly how they felt anonymously. And one of the, one of the items I read said, being able to vent like this is healing. It could be a good vehicle for under, uncovering issues at any institution. Having this kind of anonymous forum is great. Meetings with institutional leaders have been mostly one-way communication or forums where speaking the truth could be conceived as insubordinate. Zoom meetings tend to be uptight and not open and people are not very engaged. So I'm, I'm glad that this was an open forum where people felt like they could share really freely. That was the purpose. If you're still typing and sitting with your thoughts, please continue to do so. Um, Patrice and I usually like to just ask a few questions, ask folks who are willing to share, to maybe share a story or two. I did see someone commented on the differences between burnout and compassion fatigue. I don't know who you are, um, but if you have um, some nuanced definitions that you would like to discuss between the two, that's definitely a point we could discuss. Um, or if anyone wants to share something that they went through, we'd love to hear from you. We have something in the chat. What are some strategies that seem to work for people combating this kind of burnout? Self-care seems to be an overused term. What truly works to help faculty and students in need? That's a great question. Um, and as we're thinking about that question, I know some of the stories that we've heard around self-care um, is also, in some cases, it adds an additional burden. Right, like all of a sudden you hear about everybody doing self care and when you don't have, you feel like you don't have time to do that, it can create an added stress. And I've also heard stories of people um, who very much appreciate their university offering them extra time off or um, extended vacations and things like that. But then they, in some cases, I've heard stories from people where they feel it's not really authentic, right? That, you know, that they're, they're offering some of these services up, but there's um, almost like a hidden curriculum of like whether or not you should actually be participating and taking that time off. Um, but I would I would love to hear um, of because there were some we should stress there were many positive um, things in the Google Doc um, and many people talked about the joys of working from home um, and not having a commute, having more time to do things and I know I've found that fitting in things like exercise and laundry and just little things like that like it is that, that it has been a plus of working of working remotely and I agree I think it was um Greg who said that we should celebrate all the accomplishments mm -hmm. what was done in so little time and then, uh, and that was in the chat. That's how I know who it was, just to be clear. Uh, the Google Doc is still anonymous. Um, but then also in the Google Doc, somebody called out, suddenly everyone knows what an instructional designer does, I'm paraphrasing, and that that's both a positive and a negative, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which I thought was an interesting take on it. Um, but uh, I found that to be uh, an aha moment, even in my own family. My father said, oh, that's what you do. And I thought, oh, it only took you 20 years, Dad, to figure that out. Um, the unsung heroes of the pandemic, all the instructional designers, right, that made the magic happen behind mm -hmm. the scenes. Yeah, yeah, 
Um, and, you know, I, I was trying to reposition something similar. I had been talking with somebody in a, a, a session similar to this that we had done. Um, and that was where they were talking about hearing, you know, even though there was a lot of positive student feedback, there were, were of course, stories of students struggling or, you know, that didn't um, like something about a course or, you know, different examples like that. Um, and trying to remind people that, you know, for many of us, we effectively built a fully online school in weeks or months, right? Something that people normally take years to do and iterate over time. And so, yeah, I would like to reiterate that we should all feel good about the work we did. Absolutely. Um, and something else, um, Maureen mentioned in the chat um, some issues that people have and, you know, on reference, especially pe people that are single parents. Um, and I know the added burden um, of child care for a lot of people or elder care or, you know, um, has really added to the burden a lot of people are facing. And if anyone has any um suggestions of how you're managing that or maybe something that your university is doing to help with that. And one wondering I have, um, I was at a session where somebody commented that um, like they, they were concerned about having to have their camera on because in their background, they had a baby gate up, you know, or their, their small child might run through the image. And there was a lot of concern that, you know, pe that, even unconsciously, if people see images like these, they may think that you're less capable or, you know, not able to take a task on or things like that. And some people sharing that, you know, like they're, they're afraid to ask for help because they don't want they don't want anyone to think that they can't handle things. So I don't know if anyone has any stories to share about that or how you've overcome or are dealing with, you know, potential barriers like that. I like that Maureen has shared that they started a parent club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please, we would love to have you share. So it's it's actually a Harvard story. And Patrice, I don't know if you knew or you were there when it happened. But, you know, as a consultant, before I came back to SUNY Poly, you know, you're supporting all these folks all over the place. And you need to be very professional. And you need to look professional and speak professional and you know, stay on top of everything. And my partner got on the floor and crawled behind me on the floor to go get something in another room. And it was Noni and Steph, I think, were on and someone else who I'd never met before. So there's important people. And you try to make this impression in this space. He crawled on the floor behind me and without skipping a beat, one of them said, oh, I have a toddler too. <laughs> and it was this, this, this humor and emotion and empathy that was weird and misplaced that made everything okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I have a lot of faculty always asking, do we turn the cameras on? Do we not turn the cameras on? And it's that, you know, trying to find that balance of empathy and professionalism in the space is really difficult, but that was just a positive moment in all of this. Uh, Thank you. Is Can it Alexa, the, uh, you want to share something? Did you say me, Alisa? Alisa, sorry. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, you know, this is indeed a, a very, difficult time because you don't know what is right and what is wrong. And I think that story about your colleague crawling on the floor hit it on the head. I, I find that what worked for me um, is to just be human to the students, to be authentic and to share my struggles with them and let them know you're not alone. We're all undergoing this, you know, to put down that kind of professional um, mm -hmm. appearance and, and let your guard down a little bit and, and be real and say, you know, look, this is what it is. Yes, I'm in my home and I have baby gates, but I have grown children. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I have a rabbit that roams free in my house and all my <laughs> students know it 
because there's been times I had to excuse myself because the rabbit escaped or the rabbit was banging on the gates to try to get out and they love it. And it, it, um, it kind of brings a different energy to the classroom when they realize, hey, you know, we're all people here trying to make a very tough situation better. And let's just go with it, you know, lighten up our rules and, and be kinder to one another. And, and with that builds more compassion in the classroom between the instructor and the student. And then you see it between students and students. And little by little, it starts to chip away certain fears that students may have because of their background. I don't want to show my camera because I'm in a basement or because of the toddler. I've even made um, comments when I see toddlers sitting on students' laps because that's the only way they can attend the course is with their mm -hmm. baby. And I've acknowledged it. What a beautiful child you have. Oh my gosh. And we wave to the child, you know, just to kind of break down that, I don't know, whatever emotional components they're going through mm -hmm. and whatever concepts of right and wrong conduct they have in this remote setting. Does, does any of that make sense? It, you know, it hurts my heart mm -hmm. to, to even talk about it sometimes and listen mm -hmm. to it. Because in the end, we're just all human beings trying to get through an unprecedented um, historical time that we'll never forget. Do and you think that will carry forward? I, 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 lo I love that that is starting to happen. I hope it continues because we are human and we do need that coaching, mentoring, personal touch. That's what education is when you're younger, right? And then it becomes this, it becomes different in higher ed oftentimes, mm -hmm. right? So do you think we can get there and stay there? Oh gosh. Getting that more human component? I, I think, uh, yes. I, I think it's just, it's a part of us now. I don't think that we can separate ourselves from it anymore. I, at least that's what I think. I mean, maybe, maybe that's my hope, uh, my sense of positivity and, and human nature and the good in people. Um, and sometimes it just takes, unfortunately, a catastrophe of some sort or a devastating mm -hmm. event mm -hmm. to open that part of people up. And I think it feels so good that it's hard to, to take a step back from it yeah. once you experience that and, and experience how from an educator's viewpoint, how students respond so beautifully to it mm -hmm. that um, I don't see, at least for me, I don't know what, what the rest of the panel thinks, but at least for me, I, I don't think we'll lose it. I certainly hope we won't. There's too much good that comes out of it if you have your eyes open. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anyone else want an opportunity to, to share what they're thinking? I know a few people shared in the chat about like what it means to be professional and how that is changing. I don't know if anyone wants to elaborate on that or similarly, um, do we think that that will continue? Uh, all right, Christy raised her hand. You can go ahead. Well, in terms of being professional, I think a lot of people are now realizing that um, you can do your job without having to wear heels. It, it's kind of nice. <laughs> and um, I mean, I don't think that we should all dress like I am today when I'm working at home, but I think there's a big difference in what it takes to do your job. Um, the separation of what you like what you look like what you wear what all this kind of stuff what what you need to do your job where you need to do your job as well i mean for me being at home has been really good um, my mom had a heart attack over last summer um and i had to be home but i could still do my job um which was which was good and yeah thanks greg <laughs> um and i think that 
not just education, but business and all that needs to think about what is the role of the office? Do we need to be there all the time? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of us can do our jobs perfectly fine from anywhere. I did my job from the middle of the woods once because uh, somebody needs some help. So thinking about place, thinking about all that kind of stuff, thinking about professionalism, what is professionalism is really important. You bring up a really good point. I think we're seeing that in corporate America anyway. The last, um, I don't know, umpteen, that's not a real number, uh, articles that I've read is about giant businesses that aren't returning to the office, that are going to um, have an office that people can opt into coming into, almost like a WeWork or something, right? Where they can they can hot rack or hot desk, whatever they call it. Um, so I think they're, you know, Facebook is doing that. Google, a lot of the, the big firms in New York and in California, we're seeing mass exoduses out of big cities, people moving to rural areas where they can actually get homes much cheaper, but good broadband and then be able to work from somewhere else where they have a lower cost of living as well. So the ripple effect of that is it might impact our human geography. Right, so that's mm -hmm. also kind of a fascinating study in human behavior that's coming soon, so. Yeah, and I would add, I think Greg said he had some thoughts on this. Um, I think it's, at, it's um, enabled us to increase not only like the diversity of our team, but sense of belonging and inclusion. Um, you know, being able to hire people that, you know, beyond a 30 mile or whatever radius of where you are, um, creates a much, a much greater pool and increases access. And in interesting ways, um, I feel like we have built relationships on our team in ways that we wouldn't if we were just passing each other quickly in the hallway. Um, so yeah. yeah. Um, and then Greg, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, thanks, Patrice. I mean, it's it's interesting that idea of remote work, and obviously you have a distributed team at Harvard. And Whitney, you may recall that when we were at a conference last year together, one of the panels was actually on IDs in remote work. You had the title shoelaces. And uh, you know what what I found interesting in my table talk there with colleagues from across the nation was the fact that. Uh, we were really the, the poor stepchildren in terms of the lack of opportunities to actually engage in remote work. I was surprised really at how pervasive it was and accepted at other institutions. And I think part of our issue, and I'm going to make a global statement, and obviously it varies by a magnitude of 64, um, our primary identity is as a residential campus, um, our leadership our faculty. So, so faculty have a certain viewpoint and, and certain accommodations that professionals have never really had access to. Uh, meaning that, you know, your time on campus is yours to control. Whereas professionals still have much more of a factory metaphor of supervision and reporting. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think this is changing to some extent and I'd be interesting to hear other folks tell us what they're experiencing, you know, within my office, it's absolutely changing. And there is an acceptance now and understanding that remote work is feasible, possible, practical, positive. Will that permeate to old main to the top floor? I'm unfortunately not convinced that it will, because I think there's, there's a divide, there's a class divide, and I'm afraid the class divide mm -hmm. will persist even after this between academics and professionals. And the privileges that faculty are afforded that aren't extended to professionals. And remote work is part of that. So that, that's where I am. I'd love to be proven wrong. I'd love to see the world change for the positive, but um, you know, we don't know yet. Yeah, uh, just to add to that, I just got a text message from a colleague somewhere in middle America, I'll be super vague, just yesterday who found out that if she's not back on campus in the fall, that she will not have a job. And so during the pandemic, everything was remote, everything was great. Um, and so they've relocated. So there's, there's a lot of people that are gonna be in some really challenging situations as they go forward. And so hopefully higher ed will start thinking like Facebook or Google or 
some of the big firms and, and realize, I saw a comment in the chat, I can't remember who posted it, but somebody said 90 or 80 or 90% of their job was mm -hmm. remote. They just had to be in the office in order to do it, right? It was all phone and email and, and Zoom anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they had to physically go to the office in order to do that work. So I think you're right, Greg, there's there's work to be done. So Patricia, we shift to our 10 minutes power positivity, 10 minute uh, closing bit, um, where we can kind of pack a punch into the things we'll do to address either mm -hmm. our own needs or the needs of others. So the very last mm -hmm. section of the Google Doc, yeah. I noticed some people already started typing in there. Um, so we would encourage you to type, share in the Google Doc, or again, um, if you want to turn your microphone on and share with us, we would love to hear your story. Uh, and I'll add, I know a couple of people have shared um, things around exercise and yoga. If there's a website that you go to or free yoga or exercise classes you want to share, please feel free to add those in the doc as well. Hey, Patrice, it's Alex. So mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago, just randomly, an email came from I'm not sure where, um, but it was SUNY uh, focused offering two sessions of chair yoga. That was me who put the chair yoga in there. Mm. Um, and, um, and I did it last week and it's starting again in like 10 minutes. And um, mm. it's just half an hour. It's, it's being led by a person from Empire State College. And there were about, mm. I don't know, maybe 10 of us in the room. Um, and I've never done anything like that before, but I've been looking for things to do that because I sit so much, you know, and, and um, mm -hmm. so, so I, uh, you know, I'm looking for other opportunities for something like that, you know, that's easy to do. And, and SUNY provided this for, um, for us. I'm not sure again, like how it came to me or who sent it out or who can access it, but um, that's why I can't put a, a link. I, I don't know who mm -hmm. where it comes from, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a great, um, I hope they continue it. It's only two sessions that they were offering and I hope they continue it. So I have a standing desk and Alex, since you said you, you sit so much, I have two tips. Um, the folks that I work with that sit a lot get one of those big exercise balls to sit on. So they're like sitting on that during the day. I don't know if that's helpful. And then um, standing desks are really expensive and I am a miser. And so I found a furniture resale shop and found an old bar like that somebody would put in their home <laughs> and put, you know, the booze in uh, and instead it's books. Uh, so uh, it's just the right height for me and then uh, that's just an option pro tip for anybody who's looking for a standing desk on the cheap. Hey, Alex, I found a standing desk too on Amazon and it's the ones that you can sit on top of a table or something. And I found it for less than a hundred bucks. Ooh, that's a good tip. Right. So yeah. it's light enough where I can take it in the, in the good weather, like last summer, I was able to take it outside into my screen tent so I could work outside. So it's just, you can find them, you just have to look. I mean, and I can, if anybody's interested, I will go back and try to find the link on Amazon that of the one I got and it worked great. And like I said, it was probably about 20 pounds. So it made it real easy to bring in and out when I needed to.
Uh, one of the things I noticed on here was take a full lunch break. And I know one of the things that I've started to do is block that time on my calendar because otherwise inevitably um, a, meeting, a meeting will get scheduled. And I have a dog, so I actually have an excuse <laughs> where I can say to people, well, you know, like I, I have to hop off because I have to go walk my dog. Um, but it reminded me of one other thing. I think Whitney, you actually may do this. Um, something that we're talking about doing is making all meetings like 25 minutes or 55 minutes um, yeah. so, so you actually have passing time. Oh, yeah, and we, Elisa Google, has her hand raised. Yeah, we use Google Calendar and there's a setting yeah. called speedy meeting and it automatically, your default isn't 30 minutes or an hour, it's 25 or 50. And it just gives you that cushion if you need to go refill your water bottle or take a bio break, it's like already in your calendar to do so. Mm. Yeah, Elisa? Um, yes, hi. I just wanted to share there are so many uh, wonderful kind of soothing mindfulness apps that are out there on the websites. You can just Google. There are um, music that you can listen to. You can look up Calm or Headspace or Breathe. Mm -hmm. You can even uh, just listen to the sound of raindrops. You can't believe how soothing that is. If you can go on YouTube and play that off your speakers in your computer. There are a lot of inexpensive free little practices that you can embrace or sounds that you can put in the background when you work that will make a difference in how you feel while you're working. And someone I saw talked about a gratitude um, you know, be, being grateful for your work and your job and uh, writing a gratitude journal is mm -hmm. uh, very transformative for simple things. Just um, looking outside and seeing the way the sun hits the branches of the trees is something you can be grateful for. And just writing that statements, you'd be surprised how different you feel in a matter of a couple of minutes. I'm really glad you said that because there have been days where I didn't feel 100% during the pandemic and I have had to remind myself how grateful I am that I have my work. Mm -hmm. There are so many people mm -hmm. who don't have work right now and I'm truly blessed to have mm -hmm. healthy children, a happy marriage, a job. Like there are just so many things. I just have to go through that process of reminding myself. So thank you for mentioning that because the power of positivity can lift us up in really hard times. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a, a really wonderful closing thought for us today. It, it's also very nice if you could put something in your course. I've, um, I've launched this the last couple of years and with the remote transition, I've incorporated a little corner in, in my courses about self-care practices and little links for mm -hmm. students. Uh, and I've gotten great feedback on it. I've put in a little three minute breathing practice that I do in the parking lot, or if you walk in my office unannounced, you might find me doing it in my office in between classes, but little mm -hmm. practices uh, for students to help them because a lot of them don't, don't know or they don't look for self-help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a thought too, even mm -hmm. just something in an announcement to send them a link to an article on a, writing a gratitude journal would be a nice way to not only connect with your students, but to, to help them through their struggles. Well, with that, I'll say I'm forever grateful to Alex and the entire SUNY mm -hmm. system for inviting Patrice and I to spend some time with you today. Thank you for sharing so candidly mm -hmm. and authentically your feelings your hopes for the future and um, and the things that you are grateful for. It's been a fantastic hour of my life and I am forever just yeah. thankful that we had the opportunity to be with you today. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for allowing us to share the space with you. Thank you both um, and to everyone who was here and participated. Um, sometimes it's just nice to be together in community to, to mm -hmm witness each other and to 
um, you know, feel, especially in these moments, to feel some connection and connectedness and shared experience with each other. Mm -hmm. I so value the fact that you wrote that article so that we could see it and so that we could, um, and uh, to both you and Whitney for bringing it to my attention and, and mm -hmm. um, for being able to have you come and, and do this exercise with us. It was, um, for me, a wonderful way to kind of round out the summit. And, um, it's, you know, because typically we're face to face, right? And we get to mm -hmm. go out to dinner with each other and we get to chat and, and vent and talk to each other and, and just be in community. Um, this was mm -hmm. a wonderful way, I think, for us to be able to, um, to do that with each other. And I appreciate your facilitation and, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and your attention, you know, to this mm -hmm. topic and, and to this, um, you know, to, to helping us all kind of um, um, be able to, you know, get up and, and do it again tomorrow. <laughs> um, so thank you both so much for, for everything. Thank you.